Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar, Hi-Fi Data to Insights, Characterization AI, and more for Accelerated Gene Therapy. My name is Angela Anderson. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at FormBio, a computational life sciences technology and solutions company dedicated to accelerating gene therapy uh, development from discovery to the clinic. Recently, FormBio was recognized by Pharma Manufacturing for its role in accelerating gene therapy development, and we've partnered with PacBio for Streamline AAV solutions. So there's a lot of exciting new developments. Um, today, we'll be discussing how Hi-Fi data and AI is transforming the field of gene therapy, and I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers, Alpha Diallo, Head of Solution Sciences, at Forum Bio and Elizabeth Sang, Associate Director of Product Marketing at PacBio. So we'll be conducting a short Q&A at the end of the session. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat below and we'll address them during the Q&A. So with that, uh, we'll let Alpha kick it off. Please take it away. Thank you, Angela. So hello everyone, uh, as Angela mentioned, my name is Alpha Diallo and I'm the head of the solution science team at Form. My team is mainly responsible for leading scientific and technical process engagement. I'm really excited to be here today with my colleague Liz Sang from PacBio to talk about Hi-Fi Data to Insight, where we will be showing how you can use data characterization and AI solution to accelerate your gene therapy design. We have a rich agenda today. I will start by providing a quick introduction on the form bio solutions before defining some gene therapy concepts and regulatory implications. Then I will hand it out to Liz to speak about the pack bio sequencing technology. After that, we are going to do a deep dive on few use cases, focusing on fundamental questions asked by our customers. And we are going to end the webinar with some Q&A session. Let's get started. FormBio provides solutions to accelerate cell and gene therapy development from the discovery to the clinic. We are currently working with more than 20 customers, and those are mainly cell and gene therapy companies, academic institutions, and governmental organizations. We have three strategic partners, NVIDIA, Google, and PacBio. Our life science data core is the backbone of our solution. This layer will enable metadata management, data storage, backup, recovery, provenance, validation, as well as the security and compliance aspect. All data set on our platform will inherit from those functionalities and features directly. And this is really important as you know, you want your data to be secure and when you move uh, to interact with those regulatory agencies to make sure that you have the right processes to manage your data. The next layer is our bioinformatics platform. This includes collaboration, data management, workflow execution, workflow deployment, and visualization. One of the main differentiators between our solution and others on the market is the visualization tool that we are linking to the workflow output to enable biologists, our end users, to make sense of their data. We come to realization early that a lot of our end users may not be familiar with typical bioinformatics bio, bio file format. So we invested a lot into designing a solution that is intuitive to run those end-to-end -end workflows and then focus on the visualization aspect to provide to the biologists, uh, the vector design folks that we are working with, the right tool to ask questions, slash and dice the data and understand those results. Our AI layer is the top layer that we called form, FormSight AI. FormSight simulate enable simulation and predictions to understand what we have uh, in your drug construct and why you have it. This will be part of the deep dive later today. And we also have what we call FormSight optimized to help you generate and hence construct for biomanufacturing. Now moving on to the gene therapy regulations and overviews. If you go on the FDA website, 
gene therapy is defined as a technique that modifies a person's gene to treat or cure a disease. We have typically four types of gene therapies. The first one is what we call a gene replacement, when we use a new working gene to replace the function of an unworking or missing gene. We have a gene addition when we introduce a new gene into the body to target a specific aspect of what causes a disease. A gene editing when we correct mutation in a gene that is causing a disease. And what we call a gene inhibition when we deactivate or silence the expression of a mutated gene that code for a toxic protein or sometimes is coding for too much of a protein. For gene therapy to work, we need to deliver the therapeutic payload into specific cells by using what we call delivery vectors. We have mainly two types of vectors, the viral vectors and the non-viral vectors. In this example, we have the nanoparticle, which is a non-viral vectors. In gene therapy, viral vectors have been used predominantly, and that's because viruses through evolution become really good at infecting human cells. And what's happening is we are able to remove all the viral gene, replace them with the therapeutic that you want to deliver into those cells, into the body, and then let nature uh, do its work and go and infect those different cells. So selecting the right vectors is very important and uh, since they may have different characteristics. So one of them is the immunogenicity level that uh, you will have based on the vector, the transduction and packaging. This is more about the size of your payload. So based on the size, you may not be able to use some of them, such as the AAV limited at 5 KB or more exactly 4.7 KB. And you can also look at the expression long term as well as the genomic integrations as other type of consideration. Lastly, some of those have been used in clinical trials. So reusing vectors that have been already tried into the clinic is easier than bringing new one that may require more time, time and interaction with the regulatory agencies such as the FDA. Typically, drug discovery can be divided into four stages. You have the early discovery, the preclinical, the clinical, and then the regulatory and approvals. Before starting any clinical phase, usually we need to interact with the regulatory agencies, such as the FDA in the US, and provide them sufficient chemistry, manufacturing, and control CMC information required to assure product safety, identity, quality, purity, and potency. In the US, the FDA provided the guidance on how to submit those information in what we call an investigational new drug application or IND. Another way to think about those CMC required information is to think of them as critical quality attributes or CQAs. Those can be defined as a physical, chemical, biological, or microbiological property that should be within a specific range, limit, or distribution to ensure the desired product quality. The product quality and safety will be at risk if those CQAs are outside of those target ranges. So that's why it's really important to define them and then to establish the range where they are acceptable. Now, there are multiple tests available to monitor those CQAs. So if you look at the table, the middle column, you have some example of those tests. So you have the viral genome title or the infectious title to measure the potency. You have the genome identity. In terms of purity, usually we are looking at the full MC capsid ratio, the partially full capsid, the aggregate, process related impurities, looking at the residual DNA, the residual ACP. And then there are a lot of microbiological and safety tests that we can do on the safety side. And if you look at the last column on the right, you can see that there are a lot of analytical methods associated to those different tests that you want to perform. And some of those historical analytical methods have a very variability between them. So basically 
using two octagonal techniques can give you very different results. And even sometimes using the same technique at different time can give you some differences in those results. So over the last few years, there have been an emergence of NGS assay to provide more detailed and specific measurement of those CQAs. Now I will hand it off to Liz to introduce the fact biosequencing technology and describe how those CQAs can be measured using fact bio high pi sequencing. Thank you, Alpha. So PacBio is a provider of DNA sequencing. We have both long and short read sequencing. For today's talk, we're only going to focus on our long read sequencers, SQL 2 2E systems, and uh, launched last year, the Revio system. These two long read sequencers utilize PacBio's hi fi sequencing. Here are the characteristics of hi fi sequencing. First, we have long reads up to tens of kilobases which means this is entirely sufficient to sequence the full AAV genome, which is up to five kilobases. We also have high accuracy that is free of system automatic errors. This high accuracy is then important for sequencing and identifying ITR regions, distinguished flip-flop configurations, as well as unintended mutations. We can sequence both DNA and cDNA converted from RNA. Next slide. In the next few slides, I'll walk you through some publications that highlight the use of PacBio HiFi for different phases of our AAV in research and development. In phase one, we've seen customers use HiFi sequencing to discover novel AAV vectors. During the design phase, we've seen customers use uh, uh, HiFi sequencing to identify the differences of different vector designs, such as uh, certain designs cause more fragmentation and truncation issues than others. And third, while not discussed today, customers have also used HiFi sequencing to sequence the mRNA to identify if the desired transcript isoforms are actually expressed in the cell. Oh, sorry, one more, uh, going back one more, please. In the last phase, we also use HiFi rays to evaluate truncation events, impurities, and host integ integration events that may come from different production systems. So now let's walk through the publications. In the first example, the authors used amplicon-based AAV sequencing, where they designed a 2.2 kb amplicon uh, after the constant regions in the AAV species to identify a novel vector, AAV v66 which has similarities with AAV2, but are functionally distinct. The ability to sequence the entire 2.2 kilobase fragment is the reason why customers are able to identify a novel species. In a second example, customers used HiFi sequencing to characterize both single-strand AAVs and self-complementary AAVs. This purpose was to look at whether the inclusion of single guide RNAs in specific design configurations might lead to truncation events. What they discovered was that while a single single guide RNA expression does not lead to truncation events, vectors that carry dual single guide RNA expression in tail to tail configurations do lead to truncation. Further, they were able to identify evidence of recombination events between the human and the vector genome. Next slide. The reason customers choose HiFi long reads is because short reads, such as those provided by Illumina, cannot resolve full-length AAV sequences. This means the inability to, to properly identify full-length versus truncated configurations, as well as sequencing through the complex ITR regions. Next slide. As an example, a publication from last year pointed out the same AAV vector produced in two different production systems, the HEC-293 versus the insect SF9 system, show differences in the alkaline gel, shown in the upper left panel B. When they did Illumina sequencing, mapped across the entire vector region, which is shown in panel C, they could not distinguish differences using short reads of the two production systems. Further, as they showed in the quote here, the strong secondary structure of the ITRs and the differences in flip-flop configurations resulted in reduced coverage of the ITR regions compared to the rest of the genome. 
Further, even just looking outside of the ITR region, the sequencing coverage was uneven as a result of PCR bias across GC-rich sequences and homopolymers. Next slide. However, using Lowry sequencing, the authors were able to clearly distinguish the differences between the HEC-293 and the SF9 production system. They showed that the SF9 system produced a lot more truncated genomes. Further, these truncations were correlated with unresolved mutant ITRs. Next slide. To wrap up this section, the scientific literature on using PacBio for AAV sequencing has been used for discovery, for identifying impurities in packaged genomes, for looking at different production systems, and also for identifying chromosomal integration into human cells. So where does FormBio fit in? PacBio is a DNA sequencing provider. We produce sequences in the form of FAMs, FOSTA, and FOSQs. However, for secondary and tertiary analysis, to reveal insights of what these sequences mean for your vector design, we rely on our computational partner, FormBio, an all-in-one computational cloud platform. In the next few slides, I will walk you through the high-level details of what the analysis report would look like. The AAB bioinformatics workflow has the following goals. The characterization of the vector genome, such as looking at the proportion of single strand versus self-complementary or other un, um, unintended configurations, full versus truncated genomes, vector versus non-vector contamination, flip-flop configurations, and unintended mutations. Within the non-vector contaminations, it is also desired to know whether they came from the backbone, helperplasmids, repcap, or host. And finally, the long reads also enable characterization of recombination events. So let's start by looking at a single-strand AAV toy example. For each HiFi read that was mapped to the vector sequences, and here the sequences provided by the customer might include the vector, including the target region and the backbone. So in this case, from the ITR to ITR region, it is 2.4 kilobasis. The customers can also additionally provide the plas uh, helper plasmid, rep cap, host genome, and other things that might be relevant. For the reads that are mapped to the vector genome, they're characterized based on how well they align to the targeted ITR to ITR region. For example, full SSAAV reads are characterized as mapping to the entire target region shown here in black. Reads that are marked with, mapped within the uh, target region but are partial might be deemed as left partial, covering only the left ITR, right partial, or partial. We can also distinguish backbone sequences that either are within the entire backbone region or is a read through of the vector through the backbone region. Next slide. Self-complementary AAV reads are also distinguished in similar manners for full versus left, partial, and backbone. The difference is, however, is that a read is, is bioinformatically classified as self-complementary if it contains a sequence that maps to the target region on the plus strand and comes back, folds back, as you see here in the shaded light purple, uh, in the negative strand. Next slide. Therefore, characterizing single strand versus self-complementary and full versus partial versus backbone are based on these mapping characteristics. Next slide. We can also distinguish the flip-flop configurations at the ITR regions. The entire region is 145 bases. However, the differences between flip and flop are only 43 bases. The high accuracy of the HiFi reads allow distinguishing flip from flop con configurations. Next. So looking at what the workflow looks like, the reads are mapped to quote unquote genomes, which are sequences provided by the customer detailing the vector, rep cap, helper, backbone, host, and other events. Then we characterize first by vector types as single strand or self-complementary, then by subtype as full, partial, or backbone, as well as other information. Next. The next two slides showing you a toy example from a customer webinar that we did a while back. 
where we characterize both the full band and the false plus partial band in the vector. We were able to characterize that the majority of the reads came from the vector with small amounts coming from the host, repcap, helper, and some that are chimeric. Next slide. However, we're able to see the differences between the full and partial band, where there are more in the full band, partial self-complementary, but less backbone reads, whereas the full and the partial bands contain more backbone reads that are deemed self-complementary. We're also able to uh, determine the flip-flop configurations. Next. So now I'll hand it back to Alpha. Thank you, Liz, for that overview. Now let's talk about how at FormBio we collaborate with our customer and focus on specific use cases. At FormBio, we partner with your team to build what we call in silico therapeutic development program. And those programs will have different elements included in them based on the customer needs. Today, we are going to do a deep dive on the drug product characterization on the multi-candidate comparison, as well as the AI-based candidate optimization. But we also have other elements that can be interesting uh, to you, so I will just highlight them briefly now. So we have what we call a bioreactor simulator. As you know, bioreactor rounds can be very expensive, and with this application, you can do in silico prediction of what your yield will be at the end of your bar reactor run and adjust your parameters. So you can play with the bar reactor size, the type of input plasmid that you are using, uh, the molar ratio between those different plasmids in order to see how those different changes will impact the yield at the end of the day before running your bar, uh, bar reactor in, in the real life. We have the gene expression prediction. This is basically a mechanistic model that can help predict the expression of your payload into specific target tissues. We also have some immunotoxicity analysis where we can modularize the GC content, identify CPG island, take into consideration methylation and uh, the TLR9 bindings uh, leading to some toxicity issues. And if you have questions about those uh, other solutions that we have, feel free to reach out to the Form Bio team later on. I also want to mention that with all those different predictions that we are doing for our customers, it's really important to collaborate with them to do a wet lab validation. So we are providing them hypotheses, and those hypotheses will be taken into the lab, and then we are collaborating closely with them to run those validations. Most of the validation have been done with our customers, but we have partners and academia and CDMOs to run those validations if the customer is not able to do them. So the first use case is what's in your drug product? This is a fundamental question basically asked by all of our gene therapy customers. They want to have a deep understanding of what in the and gain confidence in your manufacturing process. And we work closely with PacBio to be part of their compatible program, and we created a streamlined solution where PacBio will be sequencing the data, providing it, and those analyses will take place on the FormBio platform. And then we have, have those characterization reports that we are providing at the end of the analysis to help you understand in detail what's in your drug product. So let's focus first on basically the process related impurities. And as discussed previously, this is one of the CQA that the FDA is really interested into understanding in terms of regulation and in terms of approvals. So as an input of the workflow, uh, you can provide all the plasmid that you use during your manufacturing process and those information will be used to compute the contamination. In this example, this example was manufactured using the cell line HEC293. 
So we are using the human genome as the host genome for the contamination. So if you look at the results at the top, they are divided into assigned type. Those will be the type of AAV, either self-complementary or single-stranded based on the definition that Liz presented previously, as well as any type of contamination that we were able to detect. And then you have the count, meaning the total number of reads linked to that specific assigned type, as well as the frequency. So by looking at this, and then you're looking at the second row, you can highlight a really high level of post contamination and usually this will be a direct red flag because we are not expecting as many reads aligning to the host genome. So there is basically something problematic happening uh, during the manufacturing process with that type of contamination. This example is also a single-stranded library. So we have a really high amount of self-comp that have been detected. So by seeing that other red flag, you can run in-depth analysis into understanding why those are self-comp, where is it happening, are they linked to truncation hotspot, are they linked to snapback genomes, and all the hypotheses that can help you understand why we have those high uh, frequencies there. And you can see the amount of contamination with the helteplasmid at around 2%, the red cap almost a half a percent. So if we zoom in in the AAV population, you can see the distribution of the AAV type as well as the AAV subtypes. So if you look at those two tables, we have the total frequency that will include uh, the frequency of any contamination that we detected during the analysis and only the AAV frequency as well. Those will be the two columns on the right side. And if you zoom in on the AAV type, you have the amount of full, meaning the read spanning from ITR to ITR. Those will be uh, considered fully therapeutic drug or full AAV genome. We have the left and right partials, the partials, the backbone, as well as the vector and backbone considered as read through, where basically the read will originate from the vector and uh, go into the backbone. And the information that I'm showing here will basically align with the genome identity critical quality attribute uh, that we discussed previously. Based on that contamination, a next step is to zoom in to understand where those contaminations are happening and it, it identify which chromosomes are linked to those contaminations. So in this example, you can see a lot of contamination happening on chromosome one and two, and that may be normal because they are the biggest chromosomes. Uh, and then the probability of mapping to those will be higher. But what we can do next is to look at the genes that are linked uh, to those contaminations. So understand what those genes are, and then we can run for you some open reading frame analysis to predict the impact of those contaminations. Because what we wanna do here is to mitigate the risk of those genes expressing as part of your drug product. So when we detect those open reading frame, you know, there may be some risk that those genes may express and create some adverse event uh, with your drug product. So those are the type of downstream analysis that we can also provide to have a better understanding on that impact here. And we can also look at the flip-flop configuration in terms of flip-flop happening within the self-complementary AAV as well as the single-standard AAV. So all those different combinations should be the flip-flip, the flip-flop, flop-flop, and flop-flip, and should have approximately similar frequencies. So if you see a huge variability because, uh, between those different configuration frequencies that can also be another flag that may require a downstream analysis to understand why those type of things are happening. So this complete basically uh, the characterization overview. So hopefully those different metrics are very useful. We are also working with some key opinion leaders to define 
the most important metric that those type of uh, reports should be highlighting and continuously uh, improving that collaboration with PacBio to make sure that we include all the information required by the customer moving toward uh, an NDA submission. The next use case is to help narrow down potential cost of design. So using our AI and ML model, we can evaluate hundreds, thousands, or even millions of combinations of different regulatory elements and manufacturing variables. So those elements can be the, the promoters, the entrants, UTR, poly A enhancers, backbone plasmid, red cap plasmic, etc. And the main goal of this evaluation is to rank those different combinations in silico and identify the candidate most likely to succeed in the lab. So rather than our customers starting with those hundred different possibilities, we'll be give them a handful of options in order to make it easier for them to test in the lab and also very cost effective. So in this example that I will walk through now, uh, we have 11 constructs. So they have been defined here where they all have the same backbone uh, provided by Charles River. We have different uh, promoters. Some of them are cardiac specific, the chicken beta actin and the CMV enhancer and so on. We have two gene of interest. Both of them are reported gene, uh, the GFP, which is the green fluorescent protein, and the M-Sherry, which is a red fluorescent protein. And we have a single SF40 polytel. And all those different uh, constructs will have uh, different sizes. So the first information that we will provide as output of our simulation is a classification of all those different combinations in terms of full capsid and full genomes. And if you look uh, at the results and focus on the top three, uh, that you have been classifying there, you can see that uh, there are two promoters basically performing way better than the other one. That's the AMHC and the CTNT. And then at the bottom, we have the CAG promoter, which is a combination of the CMV enhancers and the chicken beta actin promoter that is uh, performing badly. And usually, uh, we saw that the chicken beta acting promoter has a lot of truncation issues that you know uh, we identified through different experimentations that we did with customers and other collaborations uh, that we have. So now, after that classification, you can have a zoom in into the results. So what we will provide is a truncation propensity, basically the probability of having a truncations for all those different regulatory elements that you provided in your construct. So you can compare them side by side. And we also provide you those information in terms of forward replications and reverse replications. You should note that the truncation profile is basically different based on the strand uh, where the replication is happening. And that's very important. And if you look at uh, the poly A results at the bottom here, you may thought that since we have been using the same poly A as before for all the different constructs, uh, they should all have exactly the same results. But actually, that's not the case. What we realize is a lot of those estimations are context nucleotide context specific and it's not just a matter of basically replacing those regulatory elements, it's also understanding the impact of the construct as a whole leading to those truncations. Let's discuss of a customer specific use case about a problematic, cost, uh, a problematic promoter and how usually we will help provide clarity on what's happening here. So working with one of our customers early on, uh, we identified that the original construct, uh, the construct on the left side here, had a lot of issues in the promoter region. So if you focus on those two images on the left and the right, the right is the original indication, uh, the left is the original indication, and the right is 
uh, the indication where we switch the pro model. And then at the top, you have uh, the probability of having secondary or tertiary structures. And at the bottom, you have the truncation propensity in a logarithmic scale. So the higher the dot, the higher uh, the probability of having a truncation. So if you focus on the promoter region here, you can see basically a peak at around 1600 leading to a lot of truncation, but you can also see another peak around 20 or 2100 without any uh, truncation detected. And this is uh, normal because what we realize is not all the secondary structure are problematic. Some of them will increase your truncations, but others will be involved into creating more stability inside your construct. So there is no the one-to-one -one correlation having structures leading to truncation now. So our model is able to identify which type of secondary structures will be leading to truncation and which secondary and tertiary structure will be helping with the stability of the construct. So what we did here is to replace this promoter that was the chicken beta actin promoter that I said previously is linked to a lot of secondary structure and truncation with the smaller jet promoter and the impact of this can be seen where basically the truncation propensity is lowering drastically. So with those type of use cases, we can come and in silico really recommend, uh, you know, promoters that we believe will be more uh, manufacturable. And on top of that run, any type of gene expression analysis, immunotoxicity analysis as needed. So now let's talk about enhancing your gene of interest. So in a lot of circumstances, even after selecting the best combination of your regulatory element, what we have been seeing is the CDS region is still the main source of those truncations. And basically you cannot just come and substitute that CDS region because you are looking for a specific indication. Usually those are a specific genes with specific mutations that basically you would like to correct. So there is no replacement possible there. So what you can do is to find ways to enhance uh, your gene of interest. So in our model, we have a way to apply it and have multiple objectives that we want to accomplish during that single optimization. So this is really different than a codon optimization that we may be familiar with. So we are doing a construct optimization with multiple goals. So the goals that we are setting in our AI model is to lower the truncation propensity, to improve the manufacturability, to optimize the gene expression, and also lower all the immunogenicity flags. So all those different considerations will be taken into creating a new a gene of interest coding exactly for the same protein. And usually by uh, applying that method, we are able to create some new IP or create some derivative IP that our customers can use uh, for your uh, drug product. And this is an example on how that will look like. So similarly to the previous graph that I showed you, you will have all the secondary and tertiary features, probability at the top, and those are between a zero and one in terms of probability. And then at the bottom, you have the logarithmic scale again of the truncation propensities. You have in blue, the original construct, and then you have in orange, the new uh, GOI that we recommended exactly coding for the same amino acid. And with this specific optimization, we are able to reduce the truncations in the CDS region by 70%. And that led to an increase of a full AAV genome by 18%, which is not negligible. So during this webinar, we did a few things. So we were able to introduce the CQAs required for IND submission and presented how next generation sequencing can help measure them. We presented the PacBio long read sequencing technology and showed how HiFi can help reveal AAV vector genome heterogeneity with high resolution. 
We also highlighted how our gene therapy customers at FormBio are using our solutions to accelerate their program with a deep dive on the drug product characterization, multi-candidate comparison, as well as the AI-based candidate optimization. Thank you for your time and for your attention. We are looking forward to answering your question. Yeah, thank you, Alpha. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Right now, we do have a, a few that have already come in. Um, so this question goes to Alpha. Um, do you support your client bringing their own workflows on your platform? That's a good question. So on our platform, we have validated, optimized workflow uh, and that work is done by our biomatics team. But as you know, a lot of our customers, they will have their own IP, they will have their own you know, internal solutions, but they still want to use our secure platform to kind of keep all their data together. So we enable them to bring those different solutions into, into our platform. So all our workflows are written in Nextflow which is a portable workflow language. So if you have Nextflow workflows, it's relatively straightforward to bring those into the platform. We are now in the process of supporting WDL in terms of workflow language. And early next year, we are going to have integrations with community repositories such as NF Core and others, where basically any workflow publicly available in those communities, we'll be able to import those and run them directly on the form bio platform automatically. Okay, great. Thank you, Alpha. Um, this question is for Elizabeth. What is required by way of library prep? Um, are there any special considerations? Uh, no, and I should have probably put this in the chat. I will for the PacBio AAV protocol. Um, other than requiring sufficient numbers of vector genomes as input, um, and then encapsulation, there's really not anything that's very particular for the AAV library prep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and lastly, a question for Alpha, do you have any customers who have used your characterization report in an IMD submission? Yes, actually we have one, and this is something that we are seeing more and more, where basically they are asking, uh, you know, the possibility to include those reports that we are generating directly on the platform uh, into the uh, IND submission. And the example that we have was they just included the report and it seems like they didn't have any questions about the CQAs that they were reporting. And ideally, moving forward, we believe that having such detailed and specific measurement can really help our customer to show the right information in terms of safety, in terms of efficacy to the FDA in order to speed up some of those approvals. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Alpha. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your time. Um, we will be um, uploading this video to YouTube and um, we'll be sharing it with everyone who has uh, attended this meeting. And if you want to um, learn more about gene therapy manufacturing, you can please uh, scan the QR code here and um, We'll be in touch and touch with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.